Good morning, and welcome to Lansing, Michigan's capital city. As Lansing's mayor, I want to extend greetings to everyone, and especially to Dr. Marcella Wilson, a fellow University of Michigan alum, who's traveled from Maryland to share her Transition to Success program with us today. We're proud to be citizens of the city of Lansing, but we make no claims of perfection. Like most urban legacy cities, we have our challenges. In the last few years, Lansing continues to make a comeback with new economic investments that will hopefully benefit all of our people. So thank you, Dr. Wilson and everyone here for joining us to address poverty in our city. We're excited to learn together and discover newfound hope, especially for those who need it most. so happy, proud, and honored to be here. Thank you so much for coming out so early. It's really, really cold here. <laughs> really cold here. So, I want to thank you first because I'm just so honored to be here with you today. Dr. Joan Jackson Johnson. Dr. Triple J. <laughs> Great name. Your willingness to bring my work transition to success to the attention of your colleagues and your stakeholders is truly a gift this morning. But the real gift is the public service that you and your team, the Human Relations and Community Services Division, provide to your community. Your direct response to homelessness, hunger, health care access, helping at-risk infants, children, youth, adults, and families, supporting our brothers and sisters struggling with addictions, you are the voice of those most in need. You promote equity through dispute resolution citizen complaint investigations, and enforcement of wage laws. You truly serve and protect. You should know I don't really know Dr. Joan. Our paths have crossed like ships in the night very briefly. But in that moment, you became one of my heroes. Your story offering hope and help to a homeless family that you spotted living in their car at the Meyer parking lot inspired me. It truly did. You bring dignity and respect to the lives that you touch, and you and your team reflect what government should and could do. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Joan invited me here today to introduce your community to a new way of understanding and responding to poverty. Poverty not as a character flaw, riddled with stigma and shame, but as an environmentally based treatable condition. Our hope this morning is that you are inspired by our conversation today and that you come together as a community and collectively impact the culture, the response, and the outcomes of those struggling to meet life's basic needs. So let's get started. But before we get started, you should know something about me beyond that extremely well-written bio. <laughs> I am the adult child of two very strict Catholic parents who immigrated to the United States. I was raised in a working class family in Metro Detroit. You should know I am not a physician, I am not a nurse, I am not a professor, I am not a researcher. 
and I'm still amazed by the fax machine. <laughs> How does that machine work? It's just crazy to me. I don't get it. I am also, as Dr. Triple J clearly announced, a Wolverine. Yes. <laughs> However, although my blood runs maize and blue, because of rebellious children, I've written many a check to MSU. <laughs> As Joan indicated, my PhD is in health administration, and I had a wonderful career in managed health care. Thirteen years ago, I left my job as a CEO in a managed health care organization to lead a struggling charity in the city of Detroit. I wanted to work five more years to get back to my social work roots, because by training and by profession, I've always identified myself as a social worker. Well, my timing was a little off. During that time, the charity was struggling in, in a very bad way. A major recession hit the city of Detroit, and the politics of the city of Detroit were extremely corrupt. Then as today, Detroit was the poorest urban community in the nation, with the highest infant mortality rate in the nation. I left a managed care, health care environment to lead a struggling charity whose headquarters was on Cass Avenue in Detroit. And I thought this was going to be a snap. My last budget was close to $200 million a year. But O-M-G, <laughs> whoa, I was totally and completely over my head. As I'm sure most of you in this room know, not-for-profit management is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> Let's start with the funding mechanism. I run around a lot of businesses in my life, never once has a payer said, I'm going to give you half the money that you need to run your business, and you still have to do all of this stuff, but you go in and fundraise for the rest. Now, really, who runs business like this? It was the most bizarre funding mechanisms you could find. Highly regulated by multiple payers, multiple sources, the government. Oppressive competition. I don't know what it's like here in Lansing, but in Detroit at that time, it was the, the strongest survive. Everybody is chasing after the funding. It reminded me when I had little children of when they learned to play soccer. Wherever the ball would go, all the kids would run. <laughs> That's exactly how the funding mentality was. It didn't matter what your organization did. If there was a pot of money out there, all of a sudden you did that. Very, very oppressive competition. The whole concept of fundraising was beyond me. And demand always exceeded supply, the only business where that's a problem. I was in a new world, and I now had in my care 10,000 of the poorest clients in the country. From ages not yet born, and our oldest client, 103. I saw for the first time in my life hungry children, desperate mothers, abandoned elderly, the homeless. The striking thing was, and shame on me, all just 40 minutes away from my beautiful home in West Bloomfield. Who knew? I had no idea. And it was a life changer. All I saw was a system defined by services. Who does what where? 
and clients working and struggling to figure out that system. And my people in this company were doing what they were supposed to do, but not looking beyond that scope of delivery. I then ask the question, how do you treat the condition of poverty? Could you go back one slide? And no one could answer the question. No one. Even the literature couldn't answer the question. And 13 years ago, this quote inspired me. Like slavery and apartheid, poverty is not natural. It is man-made, and it can be overcome and eradicated by the actions of human beings. This quote inspired me 13 years ago and continues to inspire me today. And you should know I believe this to be true with all of my heart. Now we go to the next slide. So, let's see if it works. <gasps> it does. <laughs> to know how, who I was when I entered this charity, you have to understand where I came from. And this slide represents my lens of understanding the world. Am I too close to something? Yes. To what? <laughs> so, let's see if this is better. No? <laughs> so I have to stay back here? <laughs> oh, you just want to be close to me. <laughs> so, you really have to understand the lens from where I came from. And where I came from was running medical programs for all of my career. And in the medical world, this is how it works. You have your research and evaluation. So let's pick a disease, any disease. Anybody? MS. I got a diabetes over here. I want you to think about all of the research related to diabetes. How much? Quantities. All that research leads to evidence-based best practice. In other words, people with brilliant minds go through all that research and say, this is what works. Those evidence-based best practices are then, I'm having technical issues here, but well, we won't use a laser, lead to standards of care, which are essentially recipes. I'm squeaking again, aren't I? Just whatever you go, poison you go, you're in between, you're okay. How about here? I got to tell you, this is a first. <laughs> I just bite my ear. Okay, so those standards of care are essentially recipes. How you treat the condition. Do we allow physicians to pick and choose how to treat diabetes? The answer is unequivocally no. They have to follow that recipe. Those recipes are distributed industry-wide. Thank you. I'm going to turn this off. I have a loud voice. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. <laughs> all right. So. We don't allow physicians to pick and choose what standards they're going to deliver. They are trained and the physicians and the professionals have to follow the standards of care. Those standards of care are distributed across the industry for anybody who's treating the condition of diabetes. They're trained, they're implemented, and then data is collected. And in healthcare, 90% of providers submit their data to HEDIS. That data is collected, becomes part of the research, and the process starts all over again. So 30 years ago, amputations for diabetics were very common. 
today because of this continuous quality improvement process. Amputations today are considered an exception to care. Science and data drive practice. This system of care you can find in auto engineering, uh, jets, pretty much every industry, even cement mixing, uses continuous quality <coughs> improvement. Hair color, which I no longer use, <laughs> uses continuous quality improvement. Science and data driving practice. I'm going to give you an example of this. My father has advanced stage dementia. And when I knew something was going on, I took him to the University of Michigan, of course, and had the work up and all of that, and they were wonderful, and they took care of us, and they gave us all kinds of services and tests. Six months later, my dad went to live with my brother in North Carolina. And there's another university there. <laughs> he went there, and I purposefully did not send his medical record. Guess what happened? A new workup. A new workup, the exact same workup. Excuse me, doctor. Can you hear in the back? Because maybe we can try the microphone while we're trying to Can you hear me in the back? If you're not hearing me, raise your hand or something, okay? Because I can talk louder. I'm oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Sorry. That's all right. Exact same workup. The only difference was a slight change in his blood pressure medication. Everybody has to follow the standards of care. And if physicians and practitioners do not follow the standards of care, guess what happens? Even worse, they don't get paid. It's a standardized, regulated industry. Slide, please. So now here I come. And I ask this question, how do you treat the condition of poverty? And this is what I learned. I went to the research. How much research and evaluation do you think I found on poverty? I got a not much, very little, which is what I thought I was going to find. And what I did find was millions and millions and millions of pages Poverty sliced and diced every which way you want to look at it. Within that research, I identified evidence-based practices, home-based, wraparound, cognitive behavioral, trauma-informed care, motivational interviewing, a whole plethora of evidence-based best practices. And then guess what? Dead end. This is where our process ended, leading us to some consequences. Those consequences are <coughs> Can you still hear me? Yeah. Better? Yes. yes. Those consequences are client self navigation. We expect people with the least amount of resources to self-navigate health, human services, government, community services independently. This is synonymous of telling a patient with cancer, I'm sorry you have cancer, go figure it out. Would we ever do that? No, for two big reasons. What would happen to clinical quality? would drop. What would happen to cost? It would the second consequence of this system is individual practitioner preference. In healthcare, practitioners are not allowed to self-determine, based upon their review of the literature, how they want to treat a condition. <clears throat> it is directed, with some latitude. In the treatment of poverty, we have individual practitioners based upon their understanding, their review of the research, 
deciding how to treat the condition of poverty, all independently. This is analogous to allowing every physician to pick and choose how they want to treat the condition of diabetes. We would never allow that. The third consequence is organizational preference. In the treatment of poverty, we have hundreds of thousands of not-for-profits, all self-determining how they want to respond to the condition in their community. And I must say, when I entered the field of human service, I had never been in a field with so much compassion and desire to help. It's not an issue of people not wanting to do the right thing. It's a system that doesn't define what the right thing is across an entire delivery system. In the treatment of poverty, there is no consistency in practice, no consistency in measurement, no comprehensive cross-industry, interdisciplinary, uniform analytics to support the critical component of <coughs> continuous quality improvement. My research began. Next slide, please. Well, I'm running this struggling charity in the city of Detroit where we didn't even have a budget for toilet paper in 40 locations across the city. So when everybody told me the reason people aren't getting better is because it's a money problem, I believed them because it was certainly my experience. But my research told another story. In the United States, we have the most expensive most extensive system to help the poor in the world and in world history. One trillion six hundred and sixty billion dollars annually and this is without the funding from foundations, corporations, and I know we have Consumers Energy in the house, thank you for your donations and support, or individual giving. One trillion six hundred and sixty billion dollars. And it includes faith-based education programs, 92 distinct government programs, when they're open, of course. <laughs> 70 million enrollees in Medicaid. And in the human service sector, we have one not-for-profit for every 175 U.S. citizens. Since the war on poverty began a little over 50 years ago, U.S. taxpayers have spent over $22 trillion <coughs> on anti-poverty programs. Next slide. So with the most expensive, most extensive delivery system in the world, you'd think that we'd be rocking, wouldn't you? Yet, all that money all of those resources and in the United States of America a child is born into poverty every 33 seconds. Almost 60 percent of Americans, that's six out of ten people, will spend at least one year living in poverty between the ages of 25 and 75 in the United States of America. In the U.S., 20% of children, one in five, experience food insecurity. 47%, almost half of all Americans, do not even earn enough money to pay income taxes. Today, 41.7 million laborers nearly one-third of our workforce earn less than $12 an hour, with the majority of these jobs not offering health insurance. I learned in Detroit in those early days by talking to the clients and, and seeing their lives firsthand that poverty, counter to our culture, is not a choice. 
No one chooses to be hungry. No one chooses not knowing where they're going to sleep. No one chooses to have a car that you can't depend on to get to work on time. No one chooses to need to go to the doctor, but can't get the transportation to get there or afford the medicines that are required to, to help you. So we're going to start this morning with a little experiment to demonstrate. Oh, I got to stay here, don't I? <laughs> I'm trying to. <laughs> I want anybody in this room who wants to be poor. <laughs> Raise your hand. Come on. <laughs> don't be shy. Nobody wants to be poor. I do this little experiment all over the country, and I've been doing it for years now. Guess how many people want to be poor? Zero. Let's do another one. Raise your hand if you want your kids to be poor. Same response every audience I talk to. There is no mistake. Poverty is not a choice. No one wishes that for themselves or for their children. Slide, please. For all the developed countries for which there is data, even though we have the most expensive and most extensive delivery system, we have the highest infant mortality rate, the highest homicide rate, the highest teenage birth rate, and the highest incarceration rate. We house one quarter of the world's prisoners. American babies die within the first year of life. And remember Detroit, where I was coming from, had the highest. American babies die within the first year of life two times as often as infants in Norway, as infants in South Korea, as infants in the Czech Republic, in the United States of America. Next slide, please. High poverty neighborhoods in the US receive 15.6% less per student for public school education. There is a direct linkage between statistics for education and poverty. Children growing up in poverty complete less school, work and earn less as adults, are more likely to receive public assistance as adults, and I think we've all seen the generational cycle of poverty. 42% of children born to parents in poverty stay in poverty. It's estimated that the economic and educational effects of child poverty amount to approximately $500 billion annually in lower earnings, less <coughs> taxes paid, higher costs for subsidies. So you can see now, poverty is not just a social problem. It is directly connected to the serious economic problems our country is experiencing, particularly as it relates to the dwindling, dwindling uh, middle class in our country. Slide, please. My research continued. I had been in behavioral health for many years, and never has it came across my desk or was written anywhere that the lower the socioeconomic status of an individual, the higher is her or his risk of mental illness. And I think this really speaks to the trauma <coughs> that poverty brings to children and families. Um, we're, I was working with one of our trainers who was raised in poverty, and she lived in a shelter. And the trauma that this woman experienced in this shelter uh, was beyond belief, and it was supposed to be a safe place. Those traumatic experiences, combined with all the stressors, they lead to depression, understandably, anxiety disorders. <clears throat> Higher unemployment, 
Poverty and lack of housing affordability in poor communities account for more than half of community differences in psychiatric hospitalizations. People in the lowest socioeconomic status are two to three times more likely than those in the highest strata to have a mental health disorder. Slide, please. I learned unequivocally poverty impacts health. In 2010, Columbia University study, a study found that of all health factors they <coughs> measured, poverty had the greatest impact on health. Low-income individuals are more likely to have high blood pressure, cholesterol, become obese, or diabetic as long-term stress hormones compromise the immune system and promote weight gain. But the real shocker in my research was when I discovered and learned in mul from multiple studies that even low levels of food insecurity affect the development of children's brains, specifically white matter, gray matter, and the hippocampus. These functions support communication, emotional response, memory, muscle control, hormone regulation. And why this was particularly profound for me, because at this charity, I was running the largest Head Start in the city of Detroit. By the time I left Detroit, we had 4,000 children in our care. And I witnessed hunger every single day at school. So you can see the impact on, my gosh, if we don't get these kids enough food now, what happens to their trajectory? Diminished. And that leads again to that generational cycle, which I'm sure so many of you have witnessed yourself. But the Head Start connection and this poverty health connection was very profound. As a side note, speaking to the importance of this work, in March 2016, the American Academy of Pediatrics declared poverty the single most pressing chronic health issue facing children in the United States. Next slide, please. The poverty health connection is irrefutable. Look at the rate of the percentage of people with depression and poverty is <coughs> more than two times the rate of those not in poverty. But it doesn't stop with mental illness. Asthma, mm -hmm. obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart attacks, and cancer. But let me speak to this cancer comparison. You can see that there's a, the rates of cancer are comparable for the two populations, correct? Yeah. Everybody with me? Yes. Fairly comparable. But here's the difference. The fatality rates for people living in poverty are significantly higher. So don't let the comparable rate fool you. Approximately one-third of patients with chronic conditions have trouble paying for food and medications in the United States of America. Next slide. This slide for me is the most important slide in our story today. This is the paradigm shift. My work my life's work now is I am determined to change our nation's understanding of poverty from character flaw to environmentally based medical treatable condition. Let me explain. I'm fortunately, we're all too well aware in the state of Michigan about lead poisoning. Everybody here familiar with lead poisoning? Yeah. Lead ingestion 
leads to irritability, high blood pressure, and long-term neurological damage. We have a diagnosis, lead poisoning. We have the standards of care or the recipes on how to treat lead poisoning. And all of those services in the healthcare field are billable. Now, the important factor here with lead poisoning is, is there any genetic predisposition to lead poisoning? No. 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 Zero zilch. If you are not exposed to lead, guess what? You will never get lead. It is a condition completely and totally driven by environmental exposures. Everybody with me? Okay, let's that was fun. Let's do another. I'm from Michigan. I know we get just overwhelmed with commercials about mesothelioma, a fatal form of cancer caused by exposure to asbestos. This, like many forms of cancer, are completely and totally driven by environmental exposures. You will not get mesothelioma unless you've been exposed to lead. Your diagnosis, mesothelioma, form of cancer. Are there standards of care to treat mesothelioma? Absolutely. And do people get paid to treat mesothelioma? Absolutely. Again, no genetic predisposition. Now let's go down to the bottom, I believe it's your left. Is it your left? Where it says social determinants of health. I need to see a show of hands. How many in this room have heard of social determinants of health? Wonderful, words getting out. So, and again, this isn't Marcella, Marcella speak. This is in the literature. If an individual is exposed to food insecurity and or high crime rates and or inadequate, unaffordable housing, lack of access to basic needs and resources, limited access to quality health care, poorly performing schools, racism, unemployment, underemployment caused by non-living wage, racism, and transportation issues. Clear in the research, they will have increased rates of diabetes, increased rates of blood pressure, infant and maternal mortality, increased depression and mental health disorders, asthma, compromised immune systems, compromised brain development, and overall higher death rates. This does not include the social consequences of violent crime, incarcerations, reincarcerations, juvenile crime, child abuse, child neglect, foster care, and to my friends in Eve, where are you? Let me see some hands. Eve, where are you? There you are. Increased rates <coughs> of domestic violence. The Poverty Health Connect is direct, it's irrefutable. So my research continued, and remember I came from healthcare, so I went looking for diagnostic codes related to poverty. And guess what? The healthcare industry has recognized poverty as a condition for many, many years. And in that next column under diagnoses, you see just some of the diagnostic codes used in healthcare to identify social determinants. The problem is, you see that Z there on the code? That means that healthcare recognizes it as a diagnosis. But healthcare is not going to pay for it. And I believe the reason healthcare is not paying for it is because, unlike every other condition, there have been no standards of care to apply. That leads to my work. I'm going to get back to the story, but my work is the development of the first standards of care 
to treat poverty as an environmentally based treatable condition. And now with my technology partners uh, in a company we call Social Determinant Solutions, we now have billable CPT codes for screening and assessments of social determinants, <coughs> behavioral health, and substance abuse conditions with the corresponding standards of care for treatment and technology that in real time identifies based upon those screening results every service from federal, state, county, city, and community that aligns with those assessments in real time. The technology then tracks those referrals to make sure that our customers, the clients we work with, are actually getting the services that they have a right to receive. This paradigm shift is critical. Culture eats strategy for breakfast, according to Peter Drucker. And the reframing of poverty to an environmentally based treatable condition is at the core of my work. And it's why I was speaking all over the country. Because changing the stigma and shame is key to getting people to understand and respond. And I'm not just talking about poor people, I'm talking about us. To really understand and respond to this condition. Before I move on, I just need to see some, does this make sense to everybody? Yes. Okay, very good. We are going to have time for questions and answers at the end. So, back to my story now. Let's go back about 12 years now. I'm at the charity. It's the recession, the corrupt <coughs> government, 10,000 clients, head start. But my research told me that we had to make some changes. Now, remember at the beginning, I was only thinking about my organization. So this is what we did. We talked to every employee at the charity, 400 employees when I started, and educated them in the new understanding of poverty. We did this across 40 locations and approximately 15 unique programs, ranging from 0 to 103. We did training across all programs, top to bottom, CEO to the people keeping the buildings clean. As poverty is a treatable condition, not a character flaw. We also focused on accountability, not of our clients, but of ourselves. The way we answered the phones, the way we clean and keep safe facilities, making sure that bulbs are lit and there's toilet paper in the bathrooms. And I know that sounds trite, but it, it was like nothing I've ever seen. And infestations like I've never seen in my life. An atmosphere of respect. We used vinegar as a disinfectant. Because you do what you have to do. Second, for every person that was working on the front lines, working directly with the clients, we trained them in four basic evidence-based best practices that I plucked out of the literature. I reviewed everything and I said, these are the four keys. First, care management. Now, I came from healthcare, so I know care management. Making sure that clients get to every resource that they're supposed to be at to treat their condition. Coordinating the care. So go back to the story about my father with dementia. He needed uh, an MRI and we couldn't get in. He called the office and said we can't get in. The doctor wanted it in such amount of time. Guess what happened? <laughs> yeah. We called the MRI office and we got it. That's accountability. We train every direct line worker in Head Start all the way to the senior program, to the homeless shelter, to the Ryan and White program, and those four key practices. Now, we didn't have a financial literacy 
program. So the key was to partner and utilize the financial literacy partner we found in the community, which happened to be a bank. And they were happy to help us. Volunteerism. Four key best practices, care management, volunteerism, peer mentoring, and financial literacy. So volunteerism. We didn't have a program. There was no system in the city of Detroit to connect people with volunteer services. <coughs> what we did was we asked clients when they came in, not, no longer what do you need? We asked, what's your dream? And whatever that dream was, we would encourage our clients to volunteer in that space. So if the dream was to be a teacher, where could they volunteer? At the closest school, at the Head Start site. And what happens when you volunteer is, the first time that there's an opening for an entry level position, guess who they go to? They go to the volunteers that they like that are already know the job. So it was just a matter of our care managers asking, what's your dream? Bringing out that sense of hope and then encouraging, not demanding, not requiring volunteerism, but supporting it. Let's talk about peer mentoring. The research is crystal clear. The peer mentoring program in a 12-step program like AA is effective. It doesn't mean that we have to assign a client to a mentor and somebody coming from the suburbs comes and visits and then goes back. We encourage clients to find somebody at the organization in their life whom they looked up to that maybe was just a little bit further ahead and ask them to be your mentor and to help you. And if they didn't do it, guess what happened? Nothing, honey. <laughs> this is about client-centered service, client choice. So I didn't have to build a volunteer program. I didn't have to build a peer mentoring program. We just wrote it in to our care plans. We integrated life area surveys and maps of my dreams. The life area survey is based upon the United Way's Arizona self-sufficiency matrix. It surveys 18 domains. Remember those social determinant domains I spoke of on the previous slide? Not if, you, if you're with me. <laughs> Good. And we survey that, and then the client gives themselves a score. We don't score them. They score themselves. And they identify those areas that are priority for them. And we map the dream based upon that life area survey, we create a map that identifies every step that has to occur, every service that's available for that client to achieve their dream. I'm gonna go off script here for a minute because I just got a text yesterday that was unbelievable. Um, I am a coach. We call care managers and transition to success a coach. And I am coaching a young woman uh, who, when I first met her, was homebound, a homebound uh, disabled woman. And when I asked her what her dream was, her dream was to be able to walk to church. So that's what we mapped to. Two years later, I get a text. She bought a car. <laughs> that's the power of this work. So, we create a care network, coordinating all resources effectively. Remember that network of $1,660,000,000? That is the care network. All of the goods and services our customers are supposed to be receiving, we coordinate the care around that care network <coughs> But here's the biggie, we hold them accountable. 
So in Detroit, we did not have a women's shelter that took children. There was a, a shelter that took women and children, and they were part of our other program. In the dead of winter, much like we're experiencing here, the women told us that the heat was off at the shelter and that they had reported it, but it had been going on and the temperatures were getting colder and they were living on the ovens and space heaters. So the accountability system works like this. The, the customer tells the direct care manager, you know, we're not being taken care of, we're not getting the service. And in this case, it was heat. That care manager calls their counterpart at that agency and starts the process of accountability. Hey, so-and-so's here, the heat's not on. Oh yeah, we know. Next day, the family comes back in, guess what? <coughs> heat's still not on. Now it goes to a supervisor. Long story short, the heat didn't come on. And within 48 hours, that complaint was on my desk. I picked up the phone and called the CEO, who I knew, and said, hey, we got a problem. We talked to this person, this person, this person, and this person. And the heat is still on, and we expect it to be on immediately. And I wasn't real nice. I know that stuns all of you. <laughs> Guess what happened? The heat was on. And if the heat wasn't on, I was going to go to her funder. That is accountability. And that is what is critical to this model. The culture shift and the accountability component in and outside of our organization. So if my janitor is not getting toilet paper delivered because finance cut off the budget, instead of just being helpless because they were trained, they would bring that to me. Because he knew if I went into that bathroom and didn't find toilet paper, I was not going to be a happy camper. <laughs> Accountability at every access point is key in this model. Coordinating all resources effectively, care. So we implemented, and in the first 12 months, I started seeing miracles happening at this agency. No longer were things being stolen out of our buildings. The buildings were being kept clean. A lot of our clients became our volunteer workforce, helping us clean, keeping buildings clean, greeting our consumers as they walked in. It became a real community. But I knew I needed real research. So I connected with the Community Foundation, and I think I just nagged them until they got sick of me. And they said, okay, Dr. Wilson, we're gonna give you your first independent evaluation of your work. Your population is 150 returning citizens coming into the most violent zip code in Detroit. Really? <laughs> this is the population you give me, 150 Men and women coming out of prison to the Osborne neighborhood in Detroit where the recidivism rate was approaching 70% during a recession and before affordable care so they didn't even have health insurance. There was no new funding for services, just funding for research. So we took that challenge. We served 200 returning citizens in that three-year period. Our recidivism rate was 7%. The national average at this time was around 40%. These results are not statistically significant because the pilot size was too small. We can have a comparison group, blah, blah, blah. Nonetheless, those results got us attention. Within the next year, I had close to a million dollars awarded by the Kellogg Foundation to develop the first standards of care to treat the condition of poverty with 
an associated analytical tool, a measurement tool to measure results. This is and was then the first standard of care with uniform protocols and analytics. And the analytics, again, were the tool developed by the United Way, the Arizona Self-Sufficiency Matrix. If none of this work in interests you, I strongly encourage you to go on the internet and get that tool. It's free. It's Creative Commons. The Arizona Self-Sufficiency Matrix. The only thing I've done to the Arizona Self-Sufficiency Matrix is I've written it for the client, not for the clinician. And I've given it, I've given it a pathway to prioritize categories. And now it can all be done on an iPad instead of paper and pencil. So, today, how it works. Next slide, please. There it is. So, remember that first slide where you have to train everybody, right? So, when you go to the far left side of this screen, you will see the clients and customers. These are all the different programs and populations we can serve. And I've added a new one. At the bottom, please add employees. Mapping dreams of employees, making sure that their basic needs are met. We integrated this at the charity I was running, and it made a profound difference because unfortunately many of the people I was paying were living at non-living wages. We train organizations like 211s, education programs like workforce development, Head Starts, faith-based organizations, churches who are doing grassroots works right in the community, government organizations. We had a pilot uh, in the state of Michigan, uh, Pathways to Potential, <coughs> health care programs, and human services. We train them to integrate as appropriate the map of my dreams and the care plan. No longer asking, why are you here, but asking, what is your dream? And building upon that sense of hope. We integrate care management, financial literacy, mentoring, and volunteerism. And again, it's important. An organization doesn't have to implement all those programs. It's just a matter of maximizing that care network to ensure clients who want access have it. We integrate accountable access and using 211, and I know very well you have 211 here in Lansing, and other resources like Aunt Bertha, we identify all of the services that client is eligible for as it relates to their screening. This is the pathway for adults. We do have alternative pathways for uh, youth, older adults, and the disabled. But for the older adults, I'm sorry, for the adults, we identify basic needs, unskilled employment, literacy, GED, skilled employment training, and living wage employment. We map dreams. Next slide. I thought you might want to take a look at, this is just one of the, the screens for the uh, client survey, the life area survey. The survey screens for 18 distinct social determinant domains. You can see it's written in third grade language. A client self scores and self prioritizes. Next slide. Every client in transition to success gets their map of their dreams workbook. Whether or not an organization integrates that into their record is up to them. This is not about your records, it's about what the client actually receives. And their dream is identified, and then working with the care manager, they identify each and every resource. And together, they make sure that each and every service that they are supposed to receive is actualized in an environment of respect and dignity. The map captures all 18 domains to create a map 
of the client's dreams based upon their issues, their desires, their dreams for themselves and their family. Next slide. Okay, now the proof of the pudding. Does it work? I am very proud to tell you that as I stand here today, we have six independent evaluations of this work. And each independent evaluation done on this work has resulted in statistically significant outcomes. Let's start with Head Start. It was a dosage rate of one school year, uh, fall to spring, and then the follow-up was done the next fall. We had statistically significant outcomes with no new funding in 14 of 18 domains. Our parent educators, as they're called in Head Start, or family support workers were trained in care management. You can see by coordinating services and coordinating all of the services and, and financial support a family is eligible for, we saw statistically significant income, uh, increases in income, employment, shelter, adult education, health care. Next slide. Transportation and mobility and financial management. Under the substance abuse uh, category there in the far left, that was improved compliance with prescribed medications. Next slide. This independent evaluation was done not in an organization I was running. This was done in outpatient behavioral health at a Medicaid clinic in Detroit. The patients were referred by their physicians. The average length of stay was six visits. There was no new money for programming, uh, just for the independent research. And in an average length of stay of six visits, meaning it cost the insurance company less than $600, we saw statistically significant improvements in income, employment, food, and I know it's not rocket science. Look what happened to mental health. It's really that direct. You give somebody some hope, some food, you put a roof over their head, mentally you start to feel better. Next slide. These results were not part of the independent evaluation. I call these our paper and pencil outcomes. And to this day, I am incredibly proud of these results. For the 10 years I served at this charity, each and every year, we had 90% above compliance for, at the time I left, 4,000 Head Start children receiving up-to-date on hearing and vision screenings up-to-date on immunizations at no cost to the organization. Remember that CARE network? We worked with health plans to come provide their services on site. And we asked them to provide their services not only for our Head Start kids, but for whole families. And they were delighted to do it because it helps their numbers look good. 97% of requests were for assistance from our Ryan White AIDS, our, our men and women uh, dealing with HIV AIDS. 97% of their referrals resulted in actual care being provided because of that accountability component. And I'm so proud that since 2004, between 2004 and 2015 when I left, nine of our Homeless women in our homeless women programs received master's degrees, 16 bachelor's degrees, 25 associate's degrees, and when I left, 15 of their children were now receiving scholarships for college. These were women's, women that were considered throwaways. And the transformation when you bring that seed of hope. Not just here's some food, but what's your dream? Let's make this become a reality for you. 
Next slide. These are our newest results, and I know some of you have seen me speak before. You have never seen these results. These are brand spanking new. Uh, we, had a, we have a pilot in Hawaii. It started on two islands. These are the results out of their Head Start program. Again, no new money for program. This was all done within the Head Start budget, utilizing their existing staff, training the organization top to bottom about the new understanding of poverty, and then training those family service workers. In 18 months, we had statistically significant improvement in nine of 18 social determinant domains. Next slide. At, again in Hawaii, at their uh, Child and Family Services Unit, which is like a human service delivery program, fall 16 to spring 18, statistically significant improvement in 12 of 18 domains, again with no new funding from programming. You will note that there was a statistical significant change to the negative in adult education. Everybody with me? So, we surmise that the drop in adult education was due to the significant increase in employment and the lack of support of child care for them to go to school after work. So, seeing these results, now to go back to continuous quality improvement of using science and data. So now the organization knows that getting people a job and getting them into school isn't enough. We have to provide those child care supports. And because they have Head Start, we can expand the hours of Head Start. It's not a Head Start program, it's just child care, but we have all the facilities. They meet all the licensing fees. Next slide, please. Again, Hawaii, statistically significant improvement in 11 of 18 domains, and this is their statewide report. Again, employment, and these aren't great jobs. These are entry-level jobs that people usually find through their volunteer work. Increases in food, transportation, mental health, the use of substances decreased. Next slide. These independent outcomes, sorry, I can't help myself. These independent outcomes, can everybody hear me? Are critical because without the research and data to support the work, all we have is, yeah, that's a really good idea. We must bring science and data to the treatment of poverty. So although we have pilots all over, my real push for these organizations is let's work together, let's fill out a grant, let's get some research so we can demonstrate our effectiveness. We can see what we're doing well and where we need some help. And we can demonstrate without a doubt to the world that poverty is a treatable condition. Now I have really good news for you. If indeed this work speaks to you, and if indeed you want to take it to the next level, I have a team of researchers from Michigan State University <laughs> at the ready uh, through the School of Nursing and School oh. of Public Health. They are chomping at the bit. And I will help write any grant to get that research in the door. And just so all of you know, I will help you write any grant, and I don't charge for that. If indeed you want to integrate this work into what you're doing. Okay, I have to go don't back to my that station. Loud. <laughs> I am happy, and I do all the time. Uh, Hawaii, we just took, spoke about Hawaii. We helped them write a grant, and they now are expanding to four islands, from two to four, as a result of, of their outcomes. They are also the first state in the nation to have a uh, legislative, I don't even know what you call it, I'm not real uh, adept at politics, a legislative bill 
thank you, uh, to identify homelessness as a medical code in Hawaii. Yeah. Very cool. So this is the real story. I want to give you a caveat. These are uh, clients that we served at the organization I was running. I can tell you a little story about them. But this is some old clip, and you will note that I identify poverty as a disease. I no longer do that because people convince disease with genetics. Yeah. And although that fits in the medical world, this work is not just for the medical world. So I changed the verbiage. So when you hear that in there, just think of it as, wow, it's part of our process of always improving. So with that, I don't know who to look to to say, hit it. Hit it. They were there for me when nobody else was. Inside this building, lives are being changed and dreams are coming true. I've learned to, to, to realize that I'm worth something and um, I have dreams. It's a plan unlike any other, a program that attacks poverty on a variety of levels, from homelessness to hunger, uh, to education, to finding a job, but even much more than that. This innovative program is run by Matrix Human Services, and it's called the Transition to Success. It's a program, really, we all should care about, not only for those whose lives are being turned around, but as a society as a whole. The success means tax dollars being used more efficiently and long-term solutions to problems in our neighborhood, not just a quick fix. Walk me through a preparation before you go to your job interview. Michelle Berry is so much more than an instructor at Matrix Human Services. Her life story is a lesson for her students. Sometimes people want to get better, but they just don't know how. That was the case for 45-year-old Barry, a victim of sexual abuse for 11 years as a child, and then years addicted to drugs and alcohol. This mother of two said she had no direction. Did not know what it took to be successful because in poverty the only thing that you focus upon is surviving. She first came to the program for aftercare for her addictions. The rest is history and they gave me an opportunity to become a, um, a monitor, you know, and that's someone that, you know, that watches the clients in our residential programs. And then more and more opportunities arose. Now she helps others who've been in poverty to find a job. What are three things that you should do before going to the job interview. I sat down with Dr. Marcella Wilson, the mastermind behind the Transition to Success program. My vision is to have a national model that frames and treats poverty as a disease. Dr. Wilson says you need a tapestry of all the goods and services a family needs to move out of poverty. The hungry are fed with food handouts on a weekly basis. The first thing a person needs is food. If you're hungry, school is not going to hold a whole lot of interest. From there, housing, clothing, and health care are addressed. Then we move on to the secondary piece, which is a very honestly a minimum wage paying job. Because in this model, everyone must learn to work. From there, we go to literacy, GED, and then skilled employment training. Then comes one of the most important parts and we create uh, what's called a map of my dreams. Jamar Palmer was asked what his dream was while unemployed for three years. Unfortunately, at the time, my mind couldn't allow me to dream. But step by step, Matrix established a dream for the father of three. We're not going to just walk you through it. We're going to attack it with you. And, and, and I think that's the reason why it works. Now Jamar works at Matrix and is pursuing his dream of being an RN someday. I've learned to realize that I'm worth something. I feel good about the accomplishments that I have made. 51-year-old Denise McNear sure has a lot to be proud of. She was, in her words, unemployed, uneducated, a substance abuser, and homeless. So the biggest obstacle would have been housing you know, a place for me to stay, food for me to eat, you know, somewhere for me to go. Thanks to a program that connects renters with the landlord personally, she was able to get a place to live so she and her son could be safe. I didn't have to worry about housing, I didn't have to worry about food, I didn't have to worry about where I was going to stay if I had to go to school, if I had to study, because all that was taken care of. McNair now has a master's degree and is a licensed social worker. If I can do it, you can do it. 
I'm not nothing special. And now these clients like Michelle, Jamar, and Denise are out sharing the transition to success message. Everybody got a story, but we just got to tell that story. There is a new plan out to help battle poverty. I was just so impressed meeting it those It really people. is. Oh. And uh, uh, this is kind of going on anonymously and a lot, or quietly. A lot, you know, not a lot is. of people knowing what's, what's happening in there, but what miracles are being done. It really is. And I think it's getting some national publicity, too. So some folks are going to yeah. try to copy and help their communities. So cool. something yeah. to be proud of. It really is. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a look at what we're going to Thank you. Lights. Very good. Thank you. 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 Those are the real stories. So let me tell you, this young woman here, Michelle Berry, this was the first time I met. She was a homeless woman with children in one of our programs. Today, she is a licensed social worker working at Detroit Medical Center in the trauma unit. Wow. Yeah. Jumar Palmer, he was uh, hit by the recession. His wife left him. He lost his house. He was living in a basement. Uh, with his three children with beds on the floor. We got him into Head Start. Um, his dream was to be a nurse. He started volunteering at Head Start. Uh, today, he's back in the auto industry. He's still working on his degree. He's married and owns a home. This young lady here. This young lady here, Denise McNair, remember the prisoner reentry study, the first study we had? She was in that program. She was discharged from uh, prison, and she was living in a car with a child. And she was afraid to go for help because they, she thought they were going to take her daughter away from her. She is now a master level uh, social worker. She never worked at Matrix. She's always worked outside of the organization. But three really powerful testimonials of when you bring a little seed of hope and real treatment for a condition that changes in that in those lives. And Michelle Berry's son is now almost ready to graduate college. It's it's these are the stories that that make the difference, that really bring the work to life. But it's those stats, it's the independent evaluation that leads us to the science and data driving practice. And what I noted in human services, we're real good at this, the human interest story, because that raises money. This video raises us a lot of money. But we're not real good at the hardcore data. And this will not get us where we want to go. It's the research and the evaluation. So I cannot stress that enough. Even if you never pick up this work, if you're doing something that's making a difference, look for the money to get the research done. Next slide, please. So this is where we are today. Remember all that poverty-specific research? Well. I have been reviewing it for the past 13 years. I am sticking by the evidence-based best practices of care management, financial literacy, peer mentoring, and volunteering, all demonstrated in the literature to improve health and economic self-sufficiency. We have the standards of care the written curriculums to train individuals at the top of an organization, the direct care workers, and everybody who works in the organization. We've now trained across faith-based, healthcare, human services, government, and educational organizations. We are implementing around the country. We collect individual pilot data like you saw. But here's my missing link. This multi-site data collection, this piece here, that is my only missing link. I need an institute, a university, a research organization who believes in this work and wants to become the national database. 
once I find that institute, that entity, that university that wants to lead this work, I will turn it over all to them. And then I will retire, I promise. <laughs> Can't do that. Can't do that. That's, this is our only missing link today. This system is up and running, and now we have all the technology platforms to bring this service real time to clinicians. Next slide. Uh, how many people here are in healthcare settings? Let me see some show of hands. Okay, just a couple. I'm going to run through it really quickly. This is the, uh, the company Social Determinant Solutions, which is technology enabled transition to success. If indeed you are a healthcare entity or your human service organization partnering with a healthcare entity, this is how it works. A patient comes in, we provide the real-time social determinant behavioral health and substance abuse screening. It takes maybe 15 minutes, no physician is required. That is a billable service. Every block you see that is colored is a, a billable service. If indeed on that initial screen there is medical necessity, in other words the screen tells us that this client might have social determinant behavioral health or substance abuse needs, if so, we provide the full interview, again, a billable service that does not require any direct physician time. If indeed that client is identified as having a, a diagnosis and these tools are CMS approved, validated by the National Institute of Health, reimbursable through Medicaid, Medicare, and third-party payers, but here's the kicker, 89% clinical accuracy. So guessing games about psychiatric diagnoses are pretty much not eliminated, but truly minimized. The, the impact for medication management with this is unbelievable. If the client is referred to behavioral health, we refer, we train the behavioral health delivery system in this model, so the entire service delivery is a billable service. If the patient goes to substance abuse treatment, again, we train, it is a billable, fully implemented in that delivery system. And if not, if there's no behavioral health diagnosis, no substance abuse diagnosis, but social determinant needs, then we ask organizations to find a partner in the community, like 211, like a human service organization, like Dr. Triple J's organization, to work together. Because healthcare agencies need organizations to address social determinant needs. It's just simply good business. So, this is how the system works in a healthcare delivery system as a fully sustainable, reimbursable service. In non-medical settings, it is sustainable because we don't need extra money, we use the existing delivery system. Your only money is needed for training, which we usually pull out of training budgets, and then of course the research and evaluation. Next slide. Uh, for those in healthcare, I'm not going to go over this, but uh, you have all the billable codes here that we can work with, and the corresponding Z codes for claims tracking. And just as a side note, 39 states in the country now cover peer support services. So if you are in healthcare, chances are, I don't know about Michigan, does anybody know if Michigan covers peer support? Yes. yes. Again, sustainability, it is critical. Next slide. This is a miracle. So, about four years ago, I gave a speech just like this in Washington, D.C. In my audience was a woman by the name of Maria, who was a child care worker in a Ryan White HIV AIDS daycare clinic. At the end of my presentation, what you're going to hear me say is, do something. Don't just come, listen, and go home, because then I failed. 
She went back to Memphis. Now, I don't know this woman. I, I never even met her at the conference. She went back to Memphis, and she made a cold call to the CEO of the CC Foundation. And she said, I know you don't know me, but you need, to look, you need to talk to this woman. The work is amazing. So the call was set. Today, because of Maria, who heard me speak in Washington, D.C., we have close to 50 organizations all trained and transitioned to success, all working together as a collaborative cohort to hold themselves and the rest of the uh, delivery system accountable. We have hope generating across these delivery systems. And last week, the Head Start program, 6,000 families is coming on board next September. All because one woman became a champion for this work. I'm very proud of, of, of what's happening in Memphis and our work in Memphis got some attention. We were invited and are applying for a major grant with the NIH. And they've asked us to pick any pilot that we wanted, integrate the technology, and we'll be integrating two major medical systems into the transition to success system of care in Memphis, Methodist Laboner and the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. Hopefully if the grant gets funded, but when they invite you, you got a pretty good chance, I think, don't you think? <laughs> this will be our first independent evaluation of the technology platform that relates to this work. Next slide. So Dr. Joan asked me today to talk about how do we bring this to our community. And this is really how that works. It's really not rocket science. You find a champion. I met Dr. Joan on a panel discussion of which I was a call-in. I never even saw her face to face. She became your champion here in Lansing. This is why all of this is happening. So that's really our first section here. The next section is have a community forum. That's what this is. And you're here. People showed up. How giddy am I? This is great. <laughs> she brought me here. We could have picked spring, but winter's okay. <laughs> now the next step is, Dr. Joan is going to be asking, who wants to get together to be a part of this? If you do, we have a movement here in Lansing. If you don't, that's okay too, because I've we shared. Will, right? yeah. <laughs> so when my formal presentation is done, those of you that want to be on board and be part of this tra social transformation movement, you'll start getting together. You'll talk about training. You'll talk about staffing. You'll talk about timing. We'll talk about research and data. If indeed uh, you wish, I'm happy to bring my MSU researchers to the table. And they are phenomenal. They couldn't be here today. But uh, uh, Dr. Chan from the School of Nursing and a couple of her colleagues, they know this model and they're ready to go to work. When it's all set, and I work with you hand in hand, my people come and do a training. And my trainer is called an instructor. They're the highest level. They will come and they will train a cohort of, the first cohort is 25. They will train that 25, whoever wants to be, as trainers. I then work with your team who want to be trainers. And from that point on, you train your own community. There will be no transition to success office in Lansing. There's only one little teeny tiny one in Maryland with 1.5 employees. 
This is about pollinating social change in a grassroots train the trainer model. We then train the trainers, we train coaches. Coaches are the direct care. So you have instructors, which are my people that come to train in communities. You have trainers, which will be the people that we train for you to train other organizations to build your care network. And we have coaches. Coaches are the individuals doing the direct, face-to-face, -face life area surveys, care mapping, and planning. Make sense? Yes. Next slide. So what we're doing is we're promoting, and this is key, I don't do the training without the culture shift, paradigm shift at the core. We are promoting poverty as a treatable condition. We are integrating uniform protocols and analytics to treat poverty, to organize care, ensure access to health care, human services, government, education, and faith-based organizations. Using a train-the-trainer model, we are integrating social determinant assessments and screenings, behavioral health, validated screening and diagnostic tools, substance abuse screening and assessments, care, planning, and mapping, defining and tracking all available services. We have defined, easy to integrate, easy to use analytics. We are working towards a national system of continuous quality improvement. Next slide. Together, we're developing a community-based care network. And remember, to be in the care network, you don't have to be trained. Every service that is funded in your community is part of your network. We want to work with human service. 211 is right at the forefront. We have to be able to access the services in a timely and responsible way. And uh, again, every community, pretty much every community has access to 211 or Ann Bertha. We also have the technology platform, but I want to stress, you don't have to have the technology platform to identify and track resources. It can be done old school. Health plans. Health plans actually economically have the most to make out of this. Because if you treat the social determinants, guess what happens to the overall cost of care? <laughs> Drops significantly. Government programs, housing, workforce development, subsidies, juvenile justice, criminal justice. Head Start is prime ground for integrating. Because we know from the research, the best way to improve health and educational outcomes for children is to improve the health and economic self-sufficiency of their parents. That's how the real change occurs. And then, of course, the faith-based community, so often overlooked in delivery systems, but a critical grassroots component. And talk about hope integration. It happens there in a real way. So uniform protocols, uniform analytics, Client-centered, community-based, scalable, sustainable, because we use the already funded network, measurable, using the United Way's uh, self-sufficiency matrix, and we have pathways for young children, teens, adults, prisoner reentry, we have a curriculum for kids in sports for the, the uh, coaches to screen for social determinants and hook up the kids' families when needed. And at some point, we will be developing, if indeed we're awarded the NIH grant, a full curriculum for individuals with uh, chronic mental illness disorders. Essentially, we will be designing curriculums for every population so we can be specific and, and client-centered. In addition, um, I've just been invited to create curriculums for medical schools. So physicians will now be learning to understand poverty as a treatable condition. Next slide. 
This is just a visual of the train the trainer model. You see my people come just at the front end. I work with your team to get them certified as trainers and let the training begin. We do ask that everybody maintain their certification. And that's how we keep track of who's doing what, where. Today, I am no longer at that charity. I left that charity three years ago. I left the paycheck, the matching 401k, <laughs> all the nice things of a solid job to leave this work. And it has become my life's work, changing the nation's understanding and response to poverty. I never dreamed that I would be doing this. I never dreamed my work would be recognized as a Clinton Global Initiative. That we would have six independent, statistically significant evaluation results. Every independent evaluation has resulted in statistically significant outcomes. We have pilots in Memphis, Hawaii, the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians in Manistee. Six congregations in Detroit are now implementing Transition to Success, all started by the Third New Hope Baptist Church. Catholic Charities in Kansas. We have a program in Louisiana, in Memphis, uh, New Orleans. Programs in Michigan and Oakland County. And our newest pilot, the largest workforce development organization in the state of Wisconsin, has now implemented Transition to Success across the state of Wisconsin with the support and blessing of state government. I am giddy with excitement. This is a whole new area for us in workforce development. I never would have dreamed that I would have technology partners, particularly since I'm still amazed by a fax machine. <laughs> Our partners, Milagro, with the behavioral health screenings. River Star Technology with the referral identification and tracking systems for 50 states, D.C., and Puerto Rico. I am a published author with a book that is, continues to do well, Diagnosis Poverty, of which I will be signing books after the presentation today. I never dreamed I would be invited to present at Harvard. I never dreamed I would be invited to co-author articles with researchers from Johns Hopkins. And yesterday, I signed my first contract to work in partnership with Johns Hopkins University. Unbelievable. Thank you so much for your time, your consideration, your thoughtfulness, and your very warm welcome. Uh, Dr. John, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm touched. I really am. Thank you so much. I never dreamed of get standing ovations either. <laughs> And if I did dream it, it was I was being a rock star. <laughs> so uh, I would like to open the floor to any questions, comments. I'm a social worker. I also do thoughts and feelings. <laughs> yes, young lady. Have any doctors or medical schools had you um, present to them about the medical coding issue? And I'm asking that because they got to start. We would like them to start making the diagnosis. The question is, if I'm capturing it correctly, have I met with any medical facilities about the diagnostic coding? Or, school. or, medical. or medical schools. And the answer is absolutely yes. The first question they want to know is, what can we do that's billable? And how much time is required of the docs? And in a medical setting, if you are a Medicaid or Medicare provider, all of this work is billable with the exception of patients who are screened with social determinant issues and need comprehensive care management. 
and they don't have an associated behavioral health or substance abuse diagnosis. And that's where the healthcare human service partnerships are key. Yes. Yes. Um, you talked about your I don't remember exactly what you called it. Can you announce the organization if you're affiliated with one? Wow, that service. Thank you. I'm Sharon Gay with Holy Cross Services. And um, my question is about the folks that are doing the assessment, the social determinant of health assessment. Are they, do they need to be credentialed? Are you recommending a credentialed person? If so, what are those credentials? And what would be the staffing pattern you would recommend, say, per 100 clients? Everybody hear the question? Otherwise, I, I will repeat it. OK. so. The first question is related to credentialing. Who can screen for social determinants? We have to think of two buckets. The first bucket is in the Medicaid, Medicare space. The other bucket is the non-Medicare, Medicaid space. In the non-Medicaid, Medicare space, sorry to give you my back, there is no credentialing requirements. We are training in the church, we are training church volunteers to do the screenings. The training is intense. It's a three-day training with a lot of focus on trauma-informed care, motivational interviewing, how to do the screening. Um, when they leave that training, the people in that training are leaving with a knowledge of how to implement the system in practice, how to implement in their organization, and how to implement in community. They leave with a an implementation plan for all three areas. <coughs> they don't get paid, that depends upon the setting. So in the faith-based, it's all run by volunteers. In Head Start, the budget has family parent educators. So we use that line item of that staffing position, we use the training dollars in the Head Start budget, and we train them to do the screening. If it is a Medicaid or Medicare patient, it has to fit all the requirements that any billing would have in that setting. However, the practitioner that actually does the initial screening can be the person that is checking patients in. They're just given a tablet, fill it out. And by the time the patient gets into the patient room, the practitioner will have the full results of that initial screen. To do the full screening assessment as a billable service, it needs to be a, a, a trained medical professional. It could be a nurse assistant, uh, LLPCN, uh, obviously social workers, uh, CSWs, MSWs, bachelor level social workers. Um, whatever the Medicaid and Medicare requirements are, they still fit, but in the non-medical it's essentially you're trained, you're certified, you're good to go. What about the ratio? The ratio, that, that could follow the question. The ratio is determined practice to practice. So in Head Start, our, our ratio without the technology is one family service worker to 43 families. With the technology, the system goes much, much faster. And patients uh, can be even integrated into finding out resources and tracking them. Uh, but uh, if indeed you implement, we'll work with you on your case ratios, and then you'll find out what works. The, the staff will tell you. Other questions? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. I would just like you to address where uh, the disability Very good question. The gentleman has asked, where do, does the disabled population fit into the system? It's essentially exactly the same. The uh, young woman that I've been coaching was dis is disabled. Uh, she was homebound. Her dream was to walk to church. So we started working on health-related issues. And, and move towards that. She never really dreamed of getting a job, although she has one now. So the same question fits. What's your dream? For the disabled person, it might be, I don't want to have to struggle with getting my medications. I need, in Detroit, transportation to healthcare was a big challenge. Little known, in the United States, Medicaid plans are required 
by law to pay for transportation to and from medical appointments. We held them accountable. That's where that accountability comes in. And that's why you saw 97% compliance for my Ryan White population. And we held their feet to the fire. That's that care network. So the dreams are different. Let's do another one, and thanks for this question. Let's pretend my, the, in our youth programs in Detroit, the number one dream for our young men was, any guesses? Basketball. Basketball. <laughs> now, in this model, do we say, ah, your dream is to be a professional basketball player. Why don't we get another dream? <laughs> no. We are not bus kills. <laughs> If a youth wants to be a basketball star, guess what we map to? Basketball star. Guess what you have to do to be a basketball star? Thank you. You gotta eat properly. You gotta stay away from drugs. You gotta go to practice. If uh, you know the the homeless woman you saw, her dream was to be a social worker. She didn't even have a high school diploma. We could have been buzz kills, but no. This is your dream. This is what we're going to do. So, sir, back to your question, whether it's a child in Head Start, because we had them map their dreams, too, with pictures. And every time they had a new dream, they'd be swapping their pictures. <laughs> Teens, adults, seniors, their dreams are very different. They want socialization. They want food. They want their medications. Whatever the dream is, that is what we map to. And that's why you can generalize to so many different populations. Because it's client-centered. It's what do they want, not what we want for them. Yes? The what's online and what is Creative Commons is the Arizona self-sufficiency matrix developed by the United Way. My tool is very close to that, but I've honed it. I've changed it from the clinician filling it in to the client filling it in. It's now in third grade language. I've also added the priorities. So where is it? Where can we find it? If you get trained, oh, okay. those that are trained have uh, unlimited <coughs> printing authority to the client workbooks, the client screens, the maps, everything, unlimited. Yes? I'm Dr. Bob, I've a medical doctor for about almost 15 years, but anyway. Thank you. Um, I was talking about diagnosis codes, and of course human trafficking is now in there. You, could you say something about the, the uh, human trafficking, especially in teen population? Well, I don't have a lot of experience in the human trafficking population. The experience I have had is that these young, and it's been primarily young women that I have experience with, the level of trauma is so profound, deeply profound, that two things I think are focused on, well actually more than two, first is protection the whole concept of building that sense of safety around that client. The second is a seed of hope. And that's where the question comes in, what's your dream? The third, very honestly, in addition to, you know, we touch on trauma-informed care in the training, but by no means does anybody that gets trained come out an expert in trauma-informed care, and we're very clear about that. For the people that I've seen dealing with human trafficking, the need for consistent and superb behavioral health support services are key. I would also encourage, although this has not been tested, a real push for the peer mentoring program. Thank you so much. Thank you.